Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. My name is Zaki Hassan. I'm here with Pervez Ahmed. And uh, I, I'm here in part and, and, and in a, yeah, I'm, I'm sort of struggling with the flu. So I, I, I want uh, to, well, one that, that kind of tells you my dedication for the show, right, Zaki? You make, making the time in spite of being um, pretty bad, struggling with the cold. But uh, uh, no, well, I'm, I'm really I, excited to be back. Our, our guest for this episode yeah. warrants yeah. such a dedication and commitment. That's Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, I thank you, Omar, for being in the booth. And thank you, Hub925, for hosting us here As always. Uh, in, in Pleasanton. And uh, our guest is Yusuf Ismail, who is founder of Organic Light Photography, which has been a fixture for 20 plus years. Yeah. Yep. And uh, you are also a faculty member at Daytona College in the Bay right. Area. Yeah. And and you've been a fixture in the Bay Area for how long now? Since 1990. Yeah, I mean, I moved up here in 1990 to go to grad school and never left. So you you get to be kind of a key uh, part of the sort of the tapestry that we always talk about mm-hmm. of uh, uh, Islam here in the Bay Area. Yeah. Really, uh, so so uh, in terms of uh, Zaytuna's early days, you got to be there. You had, you had a front seat? Yeah, I would say so. Yeah, pretty front seat. I, mean, I saw it all come together. Well, I'd love if you could you could go into that a little bit. Well, it, it was. I, I mean, I I don't know the inner workings. Okay. But from my perspective, um, you know, nineteen ninety six, I finished my thesis, found myself with nothing to do. Okay. And um, decided I would do IT okay. at at uh, Mister De Nuo down in Santa Clara. Wow. So. Um, I came to Juma. This is when they had the big MCA building, and so. Uh, now, were you at Stanford? Part of that? Yeah, Sorry, I was at Stanford. Okay. You yeah, finished I was, up your dissertation. Yeah, I finished, yeah, I finished uh-huh. dissertation. I literally yeah. had nothing to do, so right. decided I would try to do some atikaf. Yeah. And, you know, I came to Juma on, on this one Juma with all my stuff, thinking I was just going to camp out in the in the masjid. And you know, I saw Sheikh Hamza um, at the time. He was my Arabic teacher, and. I went up to him after the Juma and I said, hey, I want to do Atikaf. I don't have anything to do. Yeah. Can I do it? He goes, oh, well, in the Maliki Medheb, Atikaf is only in Ramadan. And I was kind of deflated, you know. He said, but don't worry. He says, in the Hanifis, it's okay. You could do it any time of the year. I said, What's, what are the rules? What do I do? <laughs> so he told me what to do. And I pretty much went out and just camped out in Masjid in, uh, Masjid in Nur. And um, so Friday night, I had a dream that I was going to hug Sheikh Abdullah al-Qadi in Masjid al-Nur. And I had no knowledge that, you know, he was in the Bay Area. So I went to sleep, woke up in the morning on Saturday, and he's leading the Fajr prayer. And I was like, okay, this was, it took me aback. And You were familiar with him or you had met him before? I had met him before because we brought him to um, Stanford when, um, what's his name? Uh, Thomas Cleary. He came and did a talk at Stanford on uh, women in Islam. Oh, yeah. And so Sheikh Abdullah Qadi was, um, I think he was still at the time studying in uh, uh, Oregon. And Sheikh Hamza invited him to come down. So I had met him then. So I knew him. And uh, so here we wake up, and, you know, Saturday morning and he's leading Fesh at prayer. And it just like, you know, blew my mind away. I just had a dream that I was going to hug him. Right. And, and, you know, he's Shafi. And so after, uh, you know, in the second rakah, you know, they made Qunut. And so the people that were praying after the prayer had finished, they all started asking, well, why did you make the Qunut? We, this is, un, you know, they had never. They didn't, we didn't, we don't understand yet what's going on. We haven't been exposed to that. So, uh, Sheikh Abdullah Al Qadi and Sheikh Hamza, they sit down. They have an impromptu halaqa there, and they start talking about prayer and um, the variations of prayer in the different madhab. So I'm sitting there and listening to the talk. As I'm in my corner, I'm doing my atikaf, and I'm listening to the talk, and I'm I'm recognizing that oh, I do that in my prayer, and I do this mm-hmm. in my prayer, and you know they're describing all the different ways that you sit, all the different ways that you stand, and things that, you, and I realized that I had a mixture of all the different madhabs in my prayer, and one of the last things they talked about was all the four madhab are valid. It's just you want to be careful about mixing things from one madhab to another because you might be doing something in one madhab that would be permissible. And acceptable, but not not so in the nether. And I realized, oh, I don't think I know what I'm doing mm-hmm. with my prayers. So that scared me. So I didn't say anything that day. Sunday morning, he's back. He's reading, he's leading the Fajr prayer again. So on Sunday morning, I stopped him in the masjid before he left. And I told him, I said, look, two nights ago, I had a dream that I would hug you in this masjid. I, I need to hug you in the masjid. <laughs> so I, I gave him a hug. And that night, so on Mondays, Shah Hamza was teaching Arabic at MCA. Okay. So on Monday night, uh, on Sunday night, I went there to do my Arabic with uh, in the class. And then afterwards, I said to Shah Hamza, I'm like, you should teach fiqh. 
Hmm. And then he says, he says, why? And I said, because I don't know how to pray. And he looked at me, he goes, well, you know how to pray. And I said, no, I, I, I listened to you and Sheikh Abdullah al-Qaad the other day. My prayer is completely messed up. <laughs> I said, look, can you just, you know, just give me something in the Madiki method. Just let, let me, I want to follow something straight and hmm. just, you know, not, not to be like scattered all over the place. Hmm. So he, he gave me a, a poor translation of Ar-Risada, of Ibn Abi Zayl al-Qarwani. And he says, go ahead and read this. He goes, you know, if it's not clear, just come back and ask me and, and we'll figure it out. And I said, okay, fine. So, you know, that night I said, but you really, you should teach fiqh. And he goes, you think people would take the class? And I said, well, I know I would. Right. And shortly thereafter, um, well, it wasn't long after that that I got, I got married. And I kind of unplugged because I had to figure out how to live life with a companion whereas you know I lived my whole life for you know for 30 years and I'm just like you know by yourself and all of a sudden you got someone else you got to oh, worry yeah. about right so that took me a few months and but during that time um uh Sheikh Hamza had invited uh Sheikh um Sheikh Khatri Nemanna from Mauritania to come yeah. and it was at the behest of uh Sidi Tarif Arabi who needed a teacher to come and teach his kids Quran. So he asked Shah Hamza, do you know anyone? He goes, yeah, let's bring Shah Khatri. So they brought Shah Khatri. Wow. And he ended up starting to teach Maliki Fiqh. And people had told me, you know, there's a sheikh from Mauritania here. You should come and learn how to do your, you know, your Fiqh. And I said, yeah, yeah, I'm still trying to figure things out. I'll, I'll. But at the turn of the, uh, of the year, around 1997, beginning of that year, hmm. I decided, okay, let's let's do this because you know, all of a sudden my wife's pregnant and I'm like, okay, this is crazy. I don't know how to I don't know anything in my deen mm -hmm. and I'm bringing another you know, soul into this world that I'm supposed to be responsible for. I better learn my deen before I, this gets serious. Yeah. So I start sitting with Shah Khatri and everything started to snowball from there. Got I mean, it got, it got, yeah. it got really serious. Um, and it wasn't, it wasn't long after that, that, you know, the, the wheel started rolling for this, you know, Zaytuna Institute. Correct. This, yeah. And, um, you know, we were right there the whole time through, setting up everything, getting the, at least for the very, very first conference. You know, we were getting ready for that first Zaytuna conference. Days of Allah. The Days of Allah. Oh, remembering yeah, the Days of Allah. Yeah, remembering the Days of Allah, yeah. which, uh, where Dr. Omar uh, Abdullah came. 1999, I think, right? Or 2000. No? It was no maybe it was even nine, after that. Maybe it was 99. Yeah. I think, I think it was 99. 99. It was before, it was before the Y2K thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And it was, yeah, certainly before 9-11. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so... Um, and, and you little leaguers, Google Y2K. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's another story yeah. entirely. Oh my gosh, that's you go right. into that that's stuff. Right. I mean, wait. So, so I, I feel like we, we like we we missed maybe the chapter one of the story because so because but you, you introduce Sheikh Hamza as a character in the in the story, as it were, uh, in the Bay Area where he's already teaching Arabic at Masjid Noor. Yeah. Um, what was he doing prior to that? Like, I mean, what was he even on your radar? Like, what is your well, okay. first? Recollection my of an encounter. First with recollection. Hamza. My first right. recollection was probably nineteen. Subhanallah, probably ninety one. Okay. Probably nineteen. And you came here in ninety. You said. I came here in the fall of nineteen ninety to get, you know start grad school. From where? I'm just curious. So, like, Southern California. I grew up. I grew up in L.A. Yeah. Okay. Were you born? In yeah, LA? I was born. I was born in the San Fernando Valley, in North Hollywood, California, and okay. grew up there my whole life, and yeah. moved up here just to go to grad school. Right. Never intending to really stay, but sort of, like grew up. Probably like normal Muslim sort of fam you know, family. Yeah, I mean, my my, yeah. my family comes from Syria. Okay. And, you know, we're a Syrian yeah, family. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. I was yeah. just Syrian like, you, you grow up. We didn't know a lot of Syrians or a lot of other Muslims when, you know, my grand my father came here in the 50s. Okay. Um, with his three brothers. Um, they all started, you know, their own businesses doing, you know, landscaping and gardening and things like that. And, okay. You know, they raised us on that. And one of my uncles went to the, to the Air Force. Um, my grandfather was actually here back in the late 1800s, early 1900s. He worked for Ford. Wow! On the Model T, Dearborn. Yeah, and he he was he here. Was that early. wave of immigrants. Oh yeah, yeah. He was here for about 14, 14 or fifteen years. He became a naturalized citizen. Yeah, and he went back and forth, you know, Syria several times when he was here. And the, la the last time he left, I don't know how he got it there, but he took a he took he's got a Ford Model T that he took with him. Back home. Yeah, it's just a, it's a rotting hulk on the property back huh. home. I mean, it's Amazing. crazy. Yeah. I don't know how we got it back yeah. there. I, I think people listening will also be confused by the idea of being able to go back and forth to Syria yeah. and becoming a naturalized citizen. Right. Uh, that's yeah, in, no, that, that's, that, that, that doesn't happen anymore. No, it doesn't. It's just, it's, uh, it's foreign, like, yeah. words right now, right? <laughs> yeah, people, yeah, like, yeah, don't true. understand. But anyways, yeah. um, so that's when my parents came because my father was, uh, 
you know, he was born an American citizen because he, my, when my grandfather registered their birth with the American consulate, so they came here on a U.S. passport. Hmm. Amazing. Okay. You know, and then my mother came a year later. Um, so I grew up in, in Southern California. And like I said, we were just a Syrian family. Right. We didn't know a lot of other people. Um, so we kind of kept to ourselves, just me, my family, my immediate family and my uncles. And, and, you know, we had big clan Yeah, and we would, you know, was there like a mosque or something that you were? No, no, it was just, it was, it it was just, it was just us. I mean, as far as I remember. Got Hmm. it. Okay. So when I came up here, I, you know, I really wanted to like learn the Dean. Got it. And the people at Stanford, the brothers that I met there, amazing people from all over the world. I mean, that was one thing that actually blew me away. You know, growing up Muslim meant you were Syrian. That's right. Very homogenized. It was very homogenized. When yeah. I came to Stanford, you know, the first time I, I came to the, one of their Hanukkahs, there was a Chinese guy there. Yeah. I'm just like, what's this guy doing here, right? Then there was mm-hmm. a blonde-haired, blue-eyed German dude with these, oh, I'm sorry, these round spectacles, right? Yeah. I'm looking at him. I'm just like, what? I don't understand what these dudes are doing here. And huh. you know, Indians and, you know, yeah. I'm just like, what's going on? And then they, they looked at me like, what are you so amazed about? I'm like, there's, this guy's, yeah, they're all Muslim. And I'm just like, Dude, it's, not, it's like my brain was breaking at that point, you know? Yeah, yeah. So it was, it was neat seeing this, you know, thing just kind of unfold for me. Correct. And, you know, Alhamdulillah, they taught me how to read Quran. They taught me, you know, how to do the prayers and all of that. And because I didn't grow up with this stuff. I mean, we I were see. just, like I said, we were kind of a secular yeah, Syrian yeah. family. Got it. Um, so I really wanted to learn and understand what I was reading in the, in, you know, in the Quran because they had taught me how to read and that mm-hmm. was great. But I wanted to understand. And so one friend said, why don't you go to, you know, Masjid al-Nur? There's a guy there named Sheikh Hamza. He teaches Arabic. This was later on. Yeah, yeah. My first exposure was that first Eid when I was here. Okay. Um, they, they had Eid prayer. The MCA had Eid prayer at a, at a school over in Campbell where they used to rent space for the Granada Islamic School. I see. And it was in their field that they had Eid. And so... So MCA didn't have the property that they have on Scott? No, 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 okay. no, no. They only had Masjid Anur, and I they see. were still trying to run Granada Islamic School, and they were uh, renting space out of another school in got Campbell. It, got it, okay. So they, we used their field for uh-huh. the Eid prayer. Yeah. So we're there, and here's Sheikh Hamza, he's giving the khutbah for Eid. And, you know, a bunch of guys from Stanford, we come up, and we're sitting there listening to Sheikh Hamza give this beautiful khutbah. Yeah. Afterwards, they're like, and I'm like, that guy was amazing. I mean, who is that guy? And they're like, oh, <laughs> one of my friends, close friends, he goes, listen to me. He goes, you have hope. To learn Arabic. And I'm like, why? He goes, because he's a convert. He was mm. American. And he go, I said, his Arabic was impeccable. He goes, so you have hope. Don't worry. Yeah, yeah. That was the first time I met Shahamza. Hmm. The funny thing was, I ended up living right across the street from that space. For 13 years, we lived right across the street from that school. And the funny thing was, my wife, that year she became Muslim as well. And she was at that same Eid. And I didn't know. We didn't wow. meet each other for like, you know. No kidding. Yeah, we didn't meet each other for almost, what? So six years. She's a convert. She's a convert. Okay, yeah. Okay. So we we're, didn't meet each other for six years, but we were worth both mentioning there. that your wife was doula for yeah, my she, all four of my boys. Yeah, and she so. still she still is a doula. And yeah. She, yeah. I don't know. She's got over probably over five hundred births, That's more than five hundred births amazing. under her belt. Yeah. Mashallah. Yeah. She can't, we can't walk down the street in the Bay Area without someone pulling her aside. Hey, how you doing? <laughs> That's not a bad <laughs> yeah, no, legacy. Not a bad thing. Right? I know it is pretty cool. <laughs> it is pretty cool. Wow. So anyway, so that was the first time that I had actually seen Sheikh Hamza. And it was just kind of touch and go because, I mean, he's a sheikh. What am I supposed to do with it? You know, mm-hmm. but it was about four years later where people said, you should yeah. go sit with Sheikh Hamza. He's teaching Arabic. So when had he come? When, he, he came back from Mauritania and this was the first place he settled? I think so. The teaching yeah. Arabic out of out of Masjid Noor. Yeah. So he was an employee, I guess you could say, of MCA? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Like Got I said, it. I you know yeah, had yeah. a relationship with him and, you know, as a student sure. teacher relationship. Sure, sure, sure. And, uh, but, you know, I asked him to teach me fiqh and that's to, to yeah, me, right. that seemed to be the, and I don't know. I mean, Allah, I don't know, like I said, all the inner workings of everything, but from my perspective, when I asked him to teach fiqh, it seemed that he, no one had ever asked that before. Hmm, really? Yeah. Wow. I just, it was strange because like I said, we sat in that masjid that one morning and he was giving a, a dars and everyone was like, Right. This is new information, and I and I just said you should teach that. So, who was that batch of? If I mean, you know, you, you can freely name names in terms of people who were attending that first. Gosh, Salah, I you don't. don't I have Feridun, I mean, are we talking about? No, no, no. This no, is just these much are just, later. No, no, no. Oh. Feridun is much later. This Got is. It. Oh, I can tell you the story of Feridun. That one blows me away. <laughs> okay. But no, it was just the brothers who come to Fajr at Masjid Anur back in nineteen. You know, what was it? Ninety six. Ninety six. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So. 
I, I don't know. Yeah. I can remember who they were. Yeah. Okay. But anyways, it. it was it was something that to me seemed important mm-hmm. because I'm like, if you know, if you don't know your dean, I mean, that's that's a problem. Right. And at the time, you know, there was that set of books, Fiqh the Sunnah, yeah. and it was kind of con- a conglomeration of Sayyid all the Sabic. methods. Yeah, say it's Sabic. And that was okay, right. you know, but it didn't clarify things, it right? Didn't. You didn't know if you were doing things correctly or not. And so I really felt like that was something that I wanted to learn. And, and to be real and, and fair, I mean, the, the methodology of the book isn't instructive in the in, in, a, in a particular school. It's that's not, right. That's not, it's it's, it's, it's kind of an envelope in of fact, all it's, four, it's, yeah. Right. It's, it's entire methodology is choose and pick sort of the strongest opinion in your mind. Right. I guess. You right. Know? I mean, with all due respect yeah, to the yeah. book. Um, but it, that that would seem almost sort of counter to, counter productive to what you were trying to achieve. No, which exactly. Is, look, like I, I'm, I'm praying, but I'm, it's a mix of like the Hanafi prayer and the Maliki prayer and the Shafi player prayer. Right. So how do I pray that is consistent within my school? That's what I wanted. Right. right. And Fickle Sunnah just isn't. It isn't there. And so, right. you know, he, right. like I said, he gave me that book and I started reading it and there were a lot of questions. The translation of uh, Arisada. Arisada. Mm-hmm. And there were a lot of questions. And so I sat with him and then I remember he asked, he says, how's your Arabic? And I said, it's, it's, it's okay. He goes, can you do an Arabic text? And I said, probably. So he says, okay, why don't we start uh, Murshid al-Mu'in mm. by Ibn Ashim. Mm. And so it was me and one other brother, uh, Basil Dayan. He's no longer here in the Bay Area. But the name has come up. As, yeah, yeah. yeah. We were good friends with, right. with Tarif Arabi. Yeah. And, yeah. and so he, we sat together and we went over it for two weeks. We met once a week. It was our second meeting. And then Shah Hamza said, I, I need to leave. And he went he, he on a trip maybe to Mauritania. I can't remember where he went. But it was right after he left that Sheikh Khatri came. Ah, okay. And then, like I said, right afterwards is when I met my wife and we ended up getting married. And, you know, we went down that path for so almost nine months and then came back and sat with Sheikh Khatri. And we were with him. And I remember when we sat with Sheikh Khatri for the first time, um, he says, I'll start this book. He says, but I need a promise from all of you. There's like four of us at the time. Ambassador was there because he was translating for him. Um Muhammad, um, Muhammad Abdel Bari was there with us. I was there. I, I think Tarif was there. And there were a couple other brothers, but he made us take a take a promise with him that if we started this book, we would finish it with him. Uh, wow. We said, yes, we'll do it. I'll make sure. So I've heard the name Uncle Abdul Bari yeah. from like Usama yeah. and, and Mustafa. It's yeah. the same person. Same person, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah mashallah. Yeah. Good friends with Shahamza from way, way back. Right. Before we even, you know, were on the scene. Anyways... We sat with him. A few weeks go by, and Shah, Shah Hamza comes back, and then he takes over the the translation. And that that lesson, I mean, was it? So many people were coming to that class that the apartment that we sat in, it wasn't the room we were in wasn't much bigger than the room in the studio right now, hmm. so it couldn't fit. People were sitting outside on the balcony just trying to hear. I mean, it was it was that. It was like people were thirsting for knowledge in this way. Right. Wow. And it was it was right after that in 97 that, you know, like I said, the idea of Zaytuna came up. That's right. And so, like I said, from my perspective, I just keep thinking, was it my question to ask your Hamza to teach fiqh that started the ball rolling? Allah, I don't know. <laughs> but it was, like yeah. I said, it was when, when I asked him, he goes, really, do you think people would take the class? Yeah. And I said, I don't know, but I know I would. And it started going. And so, yeah. you know, we went down. And, and, and I've often said this, I mean, because I'm mean, obviously so for someone like myself, who's not local to the not local to the Bay Area, you know, Sheikh Hamza sort of comes on the national scene, as it were, yeah. circa 95, 96, or maybe even a little earlier, 94, in fact, was the first ISNA that he spoke at. But um, that I mean, none of that is you, you, you all in the Bay Area aren't aware of that. No, this person I wasn't. Is right, right. Yeah, no, yeah. I, and I've heard that across yeah. many people. Yeah, like Sheikh Hamza is sort of our local teacher. He's here. our local. He was we our local don't teacher know and that friend. He's sort of blossoming yeah. on the national scene. Yeah, and so then the name of Zaytuna begins to also permeate in terms of national discourse, right? right? And yeah. So, and then what you're describing in terms of that the, that room and the thirst for knowledge, to me, is really a, a microcosm of what was happening within the Muslim community nationally. Yeah. Sheikh Hamza introduced a an approach to the tradition that, exactly. had, that has sort of been forgotten. Right. You know, and, that and, Sheikh, been and Sheikh, Yeah, and Sheikh Khatri being someone who lived practically all of his life in Mauritania, in the desert. Right. Coming out here, he brought that tradition and it was living. It was alive. It wasn't in a book. He was the book. 
I remember one, 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 one day in one of the lessons, someone had asked him a question in what we were reading, but you know, the commentary that he needed wasn't in it. It was, it was like maybe in Muqtas al Khalil. So Sheikh Khatri, he just, he leans back and he starts, you know, his lips are moving, right? And his eyes are closed. And, you know, Shah Hamza says, hold on, he's accessing his database. You know, and everyone got a chuckle out of it, but he really was. He, he was not. reading Muqtas al Khalil until he got to the section where it described the question at hand, and then he would just answer. Right. Hmm. That it's was rote memorization. Rote memorization, but right. they knew it. They knew it. And it was, they were a walking encyclopedia. Hmm. I mean, it was just amazing. And then, you know, you're just humbled by something like that. You know, coming out of grad school with a PhD from Stanford, you think you're something, right? You think you got, you got nothing. Hmm. This guy was, a, he could go anywhere in the world hmm. and he would be fine. Hmm. You know, you wouldn't have to consult anyone. I mean, he had his knowledge with him. Hmm. And I was just like, I got, I've got a, several bookcases of books that I've got to carry with me if I want to be able to access mm. any of that knowledge. And this guy's got it all memorized in his head. Like that's knowledge. Mm -hmm. So it was really humbling, you know, mm. it put you in your place. And I said, that's, that's what we all need. We need to be put in our place That's right. because knowledge is not supposed to, you know, bring you to a level of arrogance. It's supposed to bring you to humility. When you realize that you don't know anything, the more you learn, you realize, you know, less than what you knew before you started. Right. And that was, you know, it was just a, it was an amazing experience to be able to see that, just mm. to see that alone. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, you, so you teased, before we kind of move away from this topic, because, I mean, I really appreciate the insight, um, you teased a Fairy Dune story, so we'd be remiss maybe not so to mention it. It was uh, Fairy Dune, of course, being the pri proprietor of the Rumi Bookstore. That's right. Sacred Caravan. Yeah. Someone who even people beyond the Bay Area know. Right. Familiar so with. it huh? was probably 98. Okay. We're at MCA. There was an event. And so Shah Hamza was, you know, as usual, people were just surrounding him. It was a huge crowd. And I was standing next to him. Hmm. And all of a sudden, these two guys come just barreling through all these people. They didn't care who they were, you know, who these people were. They just shoving their way through, walked right up to Shah Hamza and just took his hand mm -hmm. and said, Shah Hamza, you need to come and teach at my school. Just like that. Hmm. It pulled him aside and started telling him about it, you know? And next thing you know, we're all at Hayward, the Hayward Islamic uh, School. Ah, uh, the Hayward Islamic School that's, starts. Yep. And that's where we all started. I mean, it, it kind of all yeah. started spiraling out of Hayward. And we taught there. Shahamza taught there. Um, I taught Arabic there for, I think, one semester or one term. And then um, it just, it just yeah. started picking up right. and, you know, I mean that's kind of that's all the then then you know that's the we, precursor to Zaytuna. It was the precursor Jackson, to Zaytuna. Yeah. yeah, yeah, Jackson yeah. Street. And then it was it was that year, probably ninety eight, I think, when we started planning for that first conference, remembering mm -hmm. the days of Allah. Mm -hmm. That was a lot of work planning for that conference. I mean, the logistics. We met every week. We met several times a week planning for that. Um, and I was I was head of logistics to make sure everything went yeah. according to plan, making sure all the equipment was there, all the supplies. Getting everything set up for the for the speakers and everything. It was just a, it was an incredible amount of work. Yeah. When we finished, we had raised. I can't remember exactly what we raised the amount, but it was enough that we were able to put a down payment on the six thirty one Jackson okay. location for Zaytuna Institute. And when all that came to a head, and you know we finished the conference and everything was like boom, we're done. Now everyone started kind of like jockeying for like what they're going to do next with Zaytuna. Right. And I remember going, we were at uh, Sidi Tarif's apartment and Sheikh Hamza was there. I remember sitting at his feet. He was up on, he was sitting on the couch. I sat at his feet and I said, Sheikh Hamza, what can I do? Where do I fit in? What do I do? What, what, how do you want me to help? What can I do? Mm -hmm. And he looked at me and he goes, do you have, have $800,000? And I guess that was the, the loan that we had to pull out. And I looked at him and I said, no. And I said, okay, that was it. I had nothing else to do, right? I mean, obviously, I don't have what you need, so I'm done. There was mm -hmm. nothing for me to do. So I kind of just stepped back. And then, you know, they got the place. We started modifying it and building it up. And yeah. we went there. And Yusuf O'Connell and a bunch of brothers, uh, just a bunch of us, yeah. you know, all the young guys, we were all there. Oh, we yeah. built that yurt. There yeah. was a yurt that was there yeah, on the yurts. property. We built that in a weekend. One weekend, we built that whole thing. The, the landscaping. I mean, we built that thing up and, um, and we just, you know, we kept going 
all the classes shifted there from the Islamic uh, Hayward Sunday School. We all moved there and, you know, classes continued and, you know, the Shia were coming. Sheikh Hamd al-Aqubi came. We had Sheikh Abdul Rahman, the, the, the son of Murabit al-Hajj. He came. I mean, we had several Shia who would come through and teach there. Um, Thomas Cleary came and he would do lessons there as well. Um, I remember he was teaching the art of war. Sun Tzu is the art of war. Yeah. He taught it at Zaytuna. Right. That guy was, that's another, like, subhanAllah. <laughs> yeah. That dude was, I mean, subhanAllah. Yeah. That's amazing. I remember one, one lesson. Clary Muslim? You know what? Wondered. You know what? Yeah, yeah. He did a talk at uh, San Jose State once, uh-huh. and it was on the pillars of Islam. Okay. Right? He came out. The first thing he said was, Shadu Allah, ilaha illallah, Shadu Allah, Muhammad Rasulullah. And he continued, he goes, That's the first pillar of Islam. And it was like, <laughs> Wait a minute, did you just make the Shahada, or are you just telling us the Shahada? Interesting. <laughs> Afterwards, people came up to him yeah. and they started questioning, Are you Muslim? Right. And he goes, Look, I'm on Deen al Fitrah. Ah, okay. And that's all he said. Right. Interesting. Yeah, that's all he said. He goes, I'm, wow. you know, I'm on the Dino Fitra. And he didn't say anything after that. Hmm. You know, I didn't want to answer anyone's questions like, yes or no, I'm Muslim or not Muslim. You don't hear so much about him anymore. I wonder if yeah, I don't know what happened to him. I don't know. Where he's teaching and yeah, things like that. Yeah, but he would come. I remember that one lesson. Yeah. He came and, you know, he read, there was, he spent two hours just talking about stuff. You know, you're thinking, okay, when are we going to get to Sun Tzu, right? And <laughs> just talking and talking and talking. And then he says, okay, so he opens the book and he reads one line from Sun Tzu. And it made perfect sense because he just he just oh, primed us all for it. Right. We he didn't have to explain it anymore because he did the explanation ahead of time. And mm. we were all sitting there wondering, what are you talking about? And then he gives us the one line and we're like, Oh, yeah. that's what it it's means. It's the Mr. Miyagi moment. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, we had these wax on, wax off. Yeah, it all makes sense. We had right? great lessons there. I mean, wow. and, and it just it it was the heart of the yeah. community. Imam Zaid moves out here. Imam Zaid comes out, yeah, yeah in 2000, oh, just before yeah. 2000, uh, I think 2008 or 2007, he moves out here, mm-hmm. you know, for Zaytuna because we, they were going to start the seminary. But that was, it was, you know, it was the heart of everything. And um, 2001, we had the 9-11 thing happen. Shahamza leaves, you know, he has to leave and he goes on this, you know, worldwide That's crazy right. tour to, to talk about Islam, you know, to mm-hmm. bring people back down to earth. When he left, he needed someone to take charge of Zaytuna. He didn't know who to leave it to. So he turned to me and he goes, I need you to be the director of Zaytuna. I'm just like, Sheikh, don't do that, please. I'm going to, I'll drive this place into the ground. I'm the worst leader ever. I can't manage anything. I said, I'm so disorganized. And he, he goes, no, no, no. I don't trust anyone with it other than you. You hmm. have to take it. And I'm just wow. like, subhanAllah. Wow. And I said, no, you, you can't just leave me alone. Someone has to help me. He goes, don't worry. Don't worry. Look, uh. Oh, her name, subhanAllah. I, she's um, she's going to hate me because I can't remember her name right now. <laughs> Is she here? Is she local? Yeah, she's local. She's oh. here in Dublin, subhanAllah. Okay. She's going to hear all this, right? I'm, <laughs> maybe, I'm in maybe big not. trouble maybe, now, yeah, subhanAllah. Yeah. It, it'll come to you. It's yeah. going to come to me. Uh-huh. <laughs> and I'm stuck now. I can't get past it. Anyways, she goes, no, she's here. She'll help you because right. she was working the, the front office. And then he goes, and I'll ask Abdul Badi to come help you as well. So it was me, Abdul Badi, and you know, sister from Dublin. Sister from Dublin. She's gonna hate me. I know it. And I'm gonna see her at the end of the month too <laughs> at the Muslim family camp. So <laughs> now I'm totally in trouble. Anyways, so the, you know, we we ran it for the year while he was while he was gone. Yeah. Alhamdulillah, when he came back, then I you know I step I step back. Okay. And. You know, as the Zaytuna board started to grow and everything, I was on that. But then at one point, I remember, you know, uh, Sayyid Mubin, yeah. he comes and he asks me, he goes, Yusuf, look, I know Jazakallah Khair and you know, we, 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 we love you and we appreciate everything that you helped us with, but like, there's no really place for you to yeah. sit on. I said, Bismillah. I said, look, there's no hard feelings, nothing. I'm, I'm here. You need me, I'm here. Mm-hmm. You don't need me, I'm, I'm still here. Just whatever you guys want. So I backed out. That was just when they started the seminary in 2008. Mm-hmm. And that was it. I figured I was at that point. I was done. Zaytuna, mm-hmm. My time at Zaytuna has been spent. I did what I needed to do for it. And now it's on its own and it's going. And alhamdulillah. 2013 <clears throat> rolled around. And we're at the Zaytuna fundraiser. Mm-hmm. I can't remember which hotel we were in. Shamza walked up to me and he goes, can you teach math? I look at him like, what do you need math for? He goes, I need math at Zaytuna. Hmm. And I'm like, for what? He goes, we're trying to get accredited and we need to have quantitative reasoning in the curriculum. And I said, yeah, bismillah, what kind of math do you want me to teach? Yeah. And he goes, you know, just GRE stuff so that students, when they leave, they can, you know, go to grad. I said, yeah, bismillah, let me put together a curriculum for you. Nice. I put it together, gave it to him. 
the first, I guess, committee who looked at it said, no, 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 this is not what we want. And it was a general math course. You know, I went through algebra and yeah. trigonometry, geometry. Now, and, now, you know, is that your background? No, my background is mechanical engineering, oh. but you know, <laughs> but of course, you know that, yeah, great. you know that stuff. Yeah. So I put it together and they said, no, no, we want something more classical, like Euclid's elements. And I'm like, that's hard. <laughs> I mean, that's a hard book for students to, especially liberal arts students to jump into geometry. That's a high level geometry. I mean, it's, it's all abstract. I said, I can cover some of it in my math, in the curriculum, but I can't do all of it. You know, and they said, well, okay, fine. So we did that. And before that semester was over, before that semester was over, uh, Shah Hamza came to me and goes, can you teach astronomy? And I'm like, well, I never taught it at the college level, but yeah, I can teach astronomy. And he goes, okay, let's get you teaching. So I, the next, that next semester, I was teaching astronomy. And then Asad Tarsin, who was teaching Ibn Asher there for the Maliki Fiqh, he had to pull out. And so they that, they turned to me and said, can you teach Ibn Hashid? I'm like, well, I've only been teaching it for 13 years ever since Sheikh Atri told me to teach it. So yeah, I can teach. So Dr. Asad was teaching it? He was teaching there. He was teaching Ibn Asher there. At where? At Zaytuna. Oh, oh yeah, I yeah. didn't know that. Yeah, 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 subhanAllah. And so when he couldn't do it anymore, yeah. they asked me and I said, yeah, I can teach it. Because after after I look, you know, did it, I read the book, I think, three times with Sheikh Atri. The, the third time I was translating for him. And at, after that session, he told me, he goes, you know what? I give you a jazz. Yeah. You teach the book. Yeah. So he left, and I I continued teaching the book for close to thirteen years. Yeah, yeah. I know some people who w- were, were direct students of yours. Mashallah. Yeah. 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 So right. so In fact, our, our relative and cousin Omar. Yeah, Omar was. Omar yeah, was yeah, yeah, yeah. He went through the class. I, I remember yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. Subhanallah. Yeah. So I, then I started teaching. You know, then uh, I got math. I have astronomy. I have been Maliki fiqh, and then they asked if I could do history of science, uh-huh. and that suddenly put me in a full time. In a teaching position, I was like, okay, alhamdulillah. <laughs> so why don't you tease this a little bit um, for with regards to your own relationship and uh, an interest in astronomy? Because that's really where I wanted to take the conversation anyway. So you, The first year I was here okay. in, in grad school, you know, I was worried about one thing when I moved up here. You know, as I grew up at, at home and I lived yeah. at home up till I was 25. And I'm just like, the first thing that was worried me, the only thing really was, what am I going to do for food? Because food was a really critical issue at our house. We ate everything at home. Okay. My father slaughtered all our meat. We didn't buy meat. Oh, wow. My uncles hunted, so we had meat year-round. And it was all halal. We, we were really strict on the food. Mm-hmm. So when I was coming up here, that was my biggest concern. When I got to campus, the students said, oh, don't worry. In Ramadan, we have iftar every night, and you don't have to worry about that. Everyone cooks, and we'll all get together. So that first Ramadan, near the end of the month, I was there, and some brothers started arguing over how the month was going to end. Mm. When was Eid? Hmm. We started debating over moon sighting and all that. And I was like, what is that? What? What, what are you guys? Because we get a <laughs> phone call, you know, yeah. from Syria. Back home. Eid Mubarak. That's right. Alhamdulillah. We all got happy to tomorrow's Eid, right? And then the same thing would happen with Ramadan. So it was foreign to me that there was a, that there was a debate. Ah, and, and so the following year, that debate started up before Ramadan. And again, after, at the end of Ramadan, and I started wondering what was the big debate about. Huh. And so that's what led me down to, you know, start learning about looking for the moon. Mm. And next thing you know, um, I was the guy who was out there looking for the moon all the time. For Zaytuna. Well, in oh. the end, I yeah. like the guy here in the Bay Area. <laughs> the, Bay, the, Bay Area. <laughs> the Bay Area guy. It became, I was, within a, within a couple of years, I was the Bay Area guy. <laughs> True. Uh, I don't know how many years it's been now. Probably, I don't know, six or seven years ago, we were up on um, Highway 35, Russian, Skyline. Russian yeah, Ridge. At Russian Ridge. Yeah. We were over actually at um, Windy Hill. Ah, Open okay. Okay. And we're standing there and... All of a sudden, someone, someone, I hear this, you know, I hear this. I'm so like, man, with 40, 50 people. All of a sudden, I, what? Sidi Yusuf is here? And I'm like, what? <laughs> you know, and I remember, they're like, in Chicago, we don't do anything until we hear from Sidi Yusuf. Wow. Because that, you had already started Crescent Watch? We had started Crescent Watch, I guess it was probably in 2006. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But it was, it wasn't because of Crescent Watch. I don't know. It's just, yeah. I was, and then my wife nudged me. She goes, do you know that? And I'm like, I didn't know. You know, was like, I had no idea. Your name became synonymous with the moon sighting. With the moon sighting, right? yeah. It's, I don't know. Well, that is a conversation we will continue in just a moment. But before we do, I wanted to take a moment to thank our sponsor, 
for this show, American Muslim Fund. Founded in 2016, the American Muslim Fund is a grassroots national community foundation in the United States. Their focus is on creating donor-advised funds, giving circles, distributing grants, and building endowments for the Muslim community. American Muslim Fund is leading sacred, sustainable, and strategic Muslim philanthropy for today and future generations. Find out how your favorite nonprofit organization can take advantage of their services or learn how you or your business can partner with AMF to handle your charitable giving at www.amuslimfund.org. Perfect. Thank you, Muhi, for that. And um, yeah, so we're back with the Sidi Yusuf uh, and uh, really wanted to pick up the conversation right where we left off, which and, is... And by the way, I would love for you to thread the needle uh, between your... your uh, uh, you know, sort of freelancing as far as the, your wow. extracurricular moon yeah. sighting with uh, organic light photography yeah. and and specifically the beautiful uh, roots you give for how you came up with that name, which I think our audience will love to hear. Okay, that's that's not, a story I don't even know. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah it's not it's not as great a story. Do you want to start there, or do you want to go in? Yeah, <laughs> well, because uh, it 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 all kind of starts sure. because of the moon sighting. Sure. So the second year, yeah, you know, I saw this debate going on on campus and. It was really bizarre to me. So right. in 1993, this is like the third year, the debate on campus got really heated mm-hmm. about the moon sighting. And so at the time, the uh, RME there on campus was this brother, his name was Abdullah Baturi. He's from Nigeria. Absolutely most, one of the most charismatic people I'd ever met. Just, he could win over anyone. He was really amazing. He walked all over, you know, he was on campus. He was here doing his, um, his PhD in linguistics. From the day I met him until the day he left, and he also came back and visited afterwards, he always wore Nigerian clothes. You know, even on campus, he never like assimilated into Western culture. So he was he was someone that you know you could you could admire for his gen, for being such a genuine person. Right. So to try to you know quell the debates that were going on campus over the moon sighting and all the fighting that was taking place, he said, "Okay, look, I'm going to assign one brother here in, in our group." to do the research on moon sighting and you come in and give us a, give us a presentation at our halaqa and then we'll make a decision. We, 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 we'll, we'll use shura. Everyone's opinion will be, you know, come into it and we'll, we'll figure out what we're going to do. So this, uh, this brother, um, Aladdin Nassar, I think he's still here in the Bay Area. He's Egyptian brother, beautiful brother. He's the guy who taught me how to pray. So mashallah, he did a beautiful job presenting, mm. presented the whole thing, both sides of the issues, calculations, you know, sighting for, with your eyes and all that. You give a beautiful thing. And being a new guy on campus, and I didn't, I didn't know much about the dean. I didn't, you know, study or anything. But so I'm sitting there and I'm listening to this, this uh, lesson. And among the lesson, he brought up a hadith from the Prophet Muhammad which was, "Fast when you see the new crescent moon, and then break your fast when you see the next new crescent moon. And if you don't see it because of clouds, then just count the month as thirty days and then break the fast." So that really impressed upon me. I said, "How, you know." Simple, right? Just so easy. Anyone can do that, right? And all you had to do was be able to count to 30, right? I mean, we've got 10 fingers and you can count that, right? I mean, it's easy to do. So, so uh, Sidi Abdullah Batuti, he was really strict in how he managed the halaqa. When the presenter was presenting, no one was to talk. You have to listen to him. Afterwards, there was one round of questions. Mm-hmm. So you went around the room and everyone, if you had a question, you asked your question. When you were done with your question and you got your answer, you didn't speak again because it wasn't your turn anymore. <laughs> Then after questions were done, there was one round of comments. <laughs> so I was kind of at the end of the whole room when it came to being in line for who gets to ask a question because it went around. When it came to me, I didn't have a question. And I said, no, I don't have any questions. And then it went around now for comments. And now people were able to put their opinions into the into the mix. Well, when it came around to my turn again, I was sitting there realizing, oh, man, I'm in trouble. <laughs> I've got a question now. And I'm in the <laughs> comment round. And I know I'm delayed. doesn't like people mincing, you know, mixing things up. <laughs> so I was really kind of like, and I raised my hand. He goes, yeah. And I said, okay, I'm really sorry. Yeah. I said, I, I didn't have a question when the questions were going around, but I have a question now that's kind of a comment. And so, and he goes, don't worry, Yusuf, since you're new, I'll let you slide huh. and ask your question. So I said, okay. I said, my question is, it seems, I said, I'll, I'll, I'll comment first and then I'll finish with the question. I said, the hadith to look for the moon and start fasting and then look for it again. And if you don't see it, then count 30 days. I said, that seems really easy. And it's something that I think every Muslim in the world can do. I said, that that's my comment. It just seems that seems to be the best way to do it. It doesn't, it, 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 it takes all the fighting out. You have to just look for it. I said, my question is, 
those of you who are advocating to go out and look for the moon, how many of you have actually done that? Mm. And no one answered in the affirmative. And I said, then there's no reason for any of you to be debating this issue. Mm. If you're not doing this, then you shouldn't be debating it. Mm. Hmm. Great point. And that's where I decided I'm going to go do it. You're I mean, what's be, the point? What's yeah. the point of debating over this if no one is actually going out to look for the moon? Why even advocate for looking for the moon if no one's actually doing it? It's like a theoretical discussion yeah. up until that point. Yeah, there was no point to mm. it. So, and, and so at the end, uh, after hearing everything, Abdullah Batuti said, I think we should do what, what Yusuf thinks we should do. We should just go out and look for the moon. And I don't remember what the outcome was that month, that year when we looked for it. But from that point on, I decided I was going to look for the moon. So the following month of Shoal, at the end of Shoal, I went out to look for it. And I just stayed on campus. I went up on you know one of the buildings up there and I looked out. It was already dark. I thought I saw the crescent, but I wasn't sure it was behind trees and stuff. So I came back and I told one of my friends there, I said, I think I saw the crescent. He goes, what time? I gave him because Yusuf, you didn't see the moon. I said, I think I did. He goes, I don't think you did. And I said, okay. So I waited for the following month. Mm -hmm. I went out again and I continued to go out. And by the third month or so, I had seen the moon. Mm -hmm. And I was really sure that I'd seen it because I decided, okay, look, I don't know where I am in the cycle. So I will go out every single day and wow. I'll go up to 35 and I'll just sit there and wait. And I went there and I went for like literally the entire month. I went up there every day. And it was, you know, that was very meditative to go out there and just sit there by yourself. There's no one out there. So I would sit. So I came up on like on the 28th day and I'm like, okay, it's got to be coming soon. I didn't see anything on the 28th. On the 29th, I didn't see anything. And then on the 30th day, I saw it. And I'm like, that's got to be a new moon because it's 30 days. I mean, I can't go any further. And I went back down. I told everyone, I said, I saw the moon. They said, there's no way you saw the moon. And I'm like, why not? They're like, it's, you just didn't see it. And I'm like, okay. I'm like, forget this. I'm going to take a picture. So I had a camera. It was a Zoom. It was a Minolta Freedom Zoom 90, just a point-and-shoot camera. I took it with me the next month. And again, I counted, right? On the 29th day, I was out there, didn't see it. On the next day, I saw it. I'm like, okay, that's got to be a new moon. Picked the camera up, pushed the shutter, and went click. And it didn't, like, unclick, right? So I'm looking at the camera now. I'm looking at it, and I'm pointing it at me, and it clicks. I'm like, mm -hmm. oh. It's dark. I better hold it. I've got to hold it longer. So I click the shutter again. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. And finally it closes. I'm like, okay, I got it. Hmm. I rushed down to one hour photo, got the film processed. And I'm looking one at the film. One hour photo. That's such a. That's gone now. A vestige from the past. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, but just <laughs> drop it off. And one hour later, I got the films and I open up the pictures and I'm looking at them and it's just orange blah. Because hmm. it was one, really small. Right. Second, the lens wasn't long enough to actually make it look like anything. And third, I'm trying to hold a camera freehand in the dark, practically. So I realized I need a better camera. So I come back to campus need, and we had a thing a at Stanford. Boat. Yeah, <laughs> need a bigger boat. I went on campus and we had a thing on at Stanford called SU Markets. Okay. It would be the precursor to the Craigslist, maybe. Okay. Right? It was just a like a bulletin board type of thing. So I went and I looked for camera. Found some guy selling a Canon QL with two lenses, a 55 millimeter lens and a 70 to 210 millimeter zoom. I'm like, that's what I need. Huh. So I called the guy. I said, where are you? And he goes, I'm in uh, the uh, Second Engineering Building. And I'm like, oh, that's my building too. And that's where our offices were. Right. And I said, where are you? He goes, I'm on third floor. I said, I'll be right there. I walked up. He wanted 50 bucks for the whole thing. I walked in. I said, does it work? He goes, yeah, it works. I said, all right. I gave him 50 bucks, took the camera, went back to my office and I'm looking at it clueless <laughs> i have no idea how this thing was completely manual camera from the 60s wow it was old it was a yeah, big yeah. block of aluminum right and i'm looking at it, i'm like i have no idea how this works as i'm pointing it i'm looking through the viewfinder there's this little needle hmm. and it keeps passing through this circle right and i'm thinking well you know what it's a meter of some sort because when i point at the light it goes up when i point it in the shadows it goes down yeah and, you know it just took a little bit of you know sleuthing and pretty soon you can figure out how it worked and there were only three dials that actually did anything. There was something called a ASA and then something that had no, you know, um, label to it, but it was just numbers from, you know, B all the way to like 4,000. Hmm. And when you change that, it changes the sound of the shutter. I'm like, well, that's got to be shutter speed. <laughs> and then there was a dial on the lens. So you're just kind of eyeballing it I'm and eyeballing figuring it. out as you go. Yeah, completely. I, I just, I, I, you know, we live in an age where you go to YouTube. Yeah. Every there was no YouTube. Yeah. You find the how to video. That's right. And this is, you know, I mean, so people true. listening, there's gonna be a big chunk of people who are like, wow, what? What? I don't know what you're talking about. There was no internet. 
<laughs> there was no internet. I mean, I saw the internet. I mean, when I was in grad school, it popped, it dropped on us right when I was in the middle of grad school. I'm just like, well, this is a crazy new thing, right? <laughs> what are they going to use this for? <laughs> so it'll never go anywhere. So I, I pretty much set up a, a matrix and hmm. I bought enough film and I went through and I just set the camera up on a small tripod and I used every possible combination of just and aperture figure it out. and figured it out. Wow. I took the film in had the guy process it. When I went to pick it up, he goes, that was a messed up roll of film. And I'm like, why? He goes, some were so dark. Some were so bright. It goes, it took me forever to get them to look right. I'm like, no. I'm like, what? I said, can you run them with no adjustments? He goes, why? I said, I'm trying to figure out the camera. So, you know, the ones I looked at, they were all the same. There was no difference. Mm. But when I got them back, after he did them without adjustments, then suddenly I started realizing what I'm doing. Mm. It took me about a year. Oh, wow. To work out the camera so that I was like, I could actually go out and make a photo of the moon. So I think in 94 or early 95 was the first time that I had a really good photo of the moon. And by this time I'd been going out every single month, one to practice and second, you know, to just use the camera. And that's about the time when things really started getting serious with photography. And I started blowing all my stipend money on film and processing (laughs) Because I just, the camera bug bit me hard. <laughs> and mm. we're here in the Bay Area. I mean, this oh, is a, it's a jewel. It is. I mean, it's an absolute jewel. You've got the ocean. You're 30 minutes away from the ocean. You're two hours away from the Sierras. You've got the Bay. You've got Marin. You've got Big Sur. You've got, it's just like, it's crazy. It is, really. So I was, I mean, <laughs> photography became like my air. And I just, I couldn't do anything with it if I didn't photograph. Right. So one night, I'm in my in my in my apartment and a knock on the door and it's the Amir of the Saudi contingency on campus. Okay. So he comes knocking on the door. He's never visited me before. Nice brother though. I mean, doesn't want, you know, he comes in and Salam alaikum, I'm alaikum salam. He goes, uh, how are you? I'm like, fine. I'm like, clueless, why are you here? I said, come on in, come on in. So he comes in, we sit down, I'll make some tea, and we're sitting there talking, and he goes to me, How's your mom? And I'm like, Alhamdulillah, she's fine, but I'm thinking to myself, why are you asking? You don't know my mom. I mean, why are you asking me? I'm still trying to figure out why this guy is here. Yeah. So we chit chat for a little bit and then it kind of, he works it in. He goes, so, you know, people are saying that you see the moon. <laughs> and I'm like, well, I do. And he goes, but Yusuf, how do you know you're seeing the real first day moon? I said, because it's not there the day before. Hmm. He goes, Yusuf, you, have you, did you get training? And I'm like, no. And he, he goes, you don't have a sheikh to teach you? And I'm like, it's one moon. It's the same moon for everywhere on the planet. He goes, but how do you know where to look in the sky? And I said, I don't know. It's just, it's there after sunset. It's just there. I look and it's there. Right. He goes, look, I have a sheikh back in Riyadh. And I said, yeah. And he goes, he has a wall on the Western side of his house. And it's got 12 holes in that wall. And he has a place in his house where he stands. And for each month of the year, that hole marks where the moon is going to be. And he just needs to look in that hole. If it's there, it's there. If it's not, it's not. And I'm like, that's amazing. How does he know how to do that? Mm -hmm. He goes, that's from years of studying and learning from his shiuch and so on. And I said, that's amazing. And I said, but I know I'm seeing the moon. He goes, how do you know? You're not even in the desert. I'm like, what does the desert have to do with anything? Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, hold on. So I went into my room and I came back with the photos and I put down one of the photos that had the moon in it. And he goes, what is this? I said, it's a photo of the moon. And he looks at it and he's looking and he's looking. He goes, I don't see anything. So I pointed out to him, you know, and I was putting it dead center because I didn't know anything about composition or anything, but I put it dead center in the thing. I said, there it is right there. And he looked at it. He goes, you saw that? It was really, really fine mm-hmm. crescent. I said, you all had to, to point the camera at it. <laughs> right. And he goes, he goes, no, I think you know what you're doing. Oh. <sighs> so he leaves, right? We finish the, the That's thing. That's not where I thought the story was going, but no, yeah, fascinating. He goes, yeah. Right. He goes, I think you know what you're doing. <laughs> he left. And from that day on, no uh-huh. one ever questioned me, at least on campus whether or not I saw the moon. If I saw the moon, it was done. Wow. The month starts. That's wow. Right. When it comes to Ramadan, just ask Yusuf. Mashallah. That's when a big responsibility. It was a huge responsibility. It's something I didn't even realize what it was. I had no clue what I had gotten into. Hmm. No clue whatsoever. Right. I mean, that was your timekeeping. You're starting the month. That's right. For everyone to start fasting. And if you're wrong, yeah. yeah. If, if you could, like maybe for, for those who are listening who either are, their only exposure to this conversation is around the moon fighting, right? That, yeah. that often occurs probably once or twice a year, right? Right around this time. Exactly. Uh, for, for the hedge, as well as mostly for the beginning and the end of Ramadan. Yeah. yeah. To, to maybe kind of, in a nutshell, and I, I mean, I'm, I know I'm, I'm 
perhaps asking a lot, but to kind of give the sort of lay of the land with regards to, um, you know, the the conflicting opinions out there uh, with regards to the moon sighting versus calculations. Yeah. Would that, would you say that those are the two main sort of, you know, opinions that are out there with regards to this issue in your, pretty, in your pretty estimation? Much. Yeah, pretty much. Okay. There's, there's, I mean, it's, it's, it's really a gradient. Yeah. It really is a gradient. I mean, on one, on one hand, you've got die hard, you know, people who just will not take anything if they didn't see it. Got it. Right. Or, or if it wasn't an actual sighting. And then on the other end of the gradient, you've got people who are just like, it's full on. Let's just do the calculations and be done with all this. Right. Correct. And, but there's a, there's a, there's a broad spectrum in between. Right. And, you know, I like to think, you know, we started, we started Crescent Watch in around 2006. Okay. Because of that very problem. Right. Because the, the, the effect what came out of ISNA that said you can do calculations and predict, you know, based on a, on a calendar. Now you can know when the needs are going to come and they can predict that for 10, 15, 20 years, whatever you want. Yeah. And that, to me, and those of us who were still trying to hold on to this beautiful sunnah, felt like you're killing, you're killing a sunnah, and we don't want to lose it, right? right? It's a beautiful hadith from the Prophet, it said, whoever revives one of my sunnahs after I'm gone, it is as if you've revived my life. Mm-hmm. That's powerful stuff for me. I mean, to think that I'm able to keep the, you know, something of the Prophet Muhammad alive in this world mm-hmm. 1,440 years later, to me, is really important. Mm-hmm. And so I had always been someone who just went out and looked for the moon. I used to take equipment with me, you know, one, the camera to photograph, but I also used to take binoculars. I used to take, uh, you know, an inclinometer to measure its altitude and compass to get azimuth to get all the data and everything. One, one, there was one Rajab, can't remember the year, probably 2000, probably 2009, maybe earlier. I, the, it's, it's a blur, but I had, I had gone out with a, a group of young boys from SBIA. They wanted me to start training people to get used to seeing the moon. So I'd taken them out. We were on Russian Ridge and we were there. It was Rajab, and we didn't see the moon with our eyes, but I had a pair of binoculars and I was able to see it with binoculars and none of the boys could see it even with binoculars. Mm. And so I came back down and also in 2000, you know, Sheikh Salik, uh, he had come from Mauritania. We had brought him through Zaytuna. So every month I would, you know, consult with him. I saw the moon or didn't see the moon. We kept track things together. So that one month I went and I told him, I said, we saw the moon. He said, who? I said, just me. He goes, who was with you? I said, I had four, four other young men with me. And he says, they didn't see it. I said, no, but I saw it with binoculars. He said, that's a problem. Hmm. I said, why? He says, the month starts for you, but it didn't start for any of us. Because hmm. when you see the moon, the ru'ya has to be with your naked eye and you have to have witnesses. He goes, but if, even if you don't have a witness, so your sighting doesn't count because you didn't have a corroborating witness. You need two people to witness, two men or a man and two women. Mm-hmm. And I said, okay. He goes, but you saw it and you're certain. I said, yeah, I know. I, I know the moon. I've been looking at it for you know, more than 10 years. Mm-hmm. And I said, I saw it. He goes, the month starts for you. Hmm. Wow. And I said, okay. He goes, so now what are you going to do? And I said, I don't know. It's a problem now. Isn't it? And he goes, it's a big problem. He goes, stop using binoculars. I see. He goes, rely on your eyes. Don't Thanks. use any tools because if you use tools, if you saw it and no one else saw it, it might start Ramadan for you. And now you have to fast when no one else can fast. And you're going to have to break your fast before anyone else can break their fast. You're going to create a problem. Hmm. Wow. And I said, okay. Right, right. No, no, no. Okay. I'm, I'm trying to yeah. sort of absorb. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I put my binoculars away okay. and didn't use them. I, and I still, there was only one time when I brought it out. Right. Um, to use them. And my, and you know, my kids growing up, they were with me moon sighting as soon as they could walk. So they know moon sighting. And my one, my younger son, he's got, he's got eagle eye vision. I mean, his, his, <laughs> his, his vision is like 2010. It's really sharp. Right. And so he'll see it before any of us. And so a couple of years ago, I had already gotten word that the moon was seen in Florida. It was seen in Texas, it was seen in several places in the United States. And so I had, we had a big group out on Russian Ridge and I wanted to make sure everyone saw it. And so I brought the binoculars with me so I could quickly find it and point it out for everyone. And we were having trouble finding it. And I'm like itching to take the binoculars out because I already know we had valid sightings. And so it was just a formality for us on the West Coast. And all my kids were like, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't take the binoculars out. Please don't do it. <laughs> they didn't want me to take the binoculars out. Mm. In the end, I took them out anyway because I wanted to make sure everyone saw the moon. So I found it and showed everyone where the moon was. But yeah, I, do, I don't use the binoculars anymore. The camera's there. And as soon as I see it with my eyes, then I 
put the camera on it, we take a picture. Right. So, so that 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 example, I think, gonna, kind of serves as a as a good way to uh, also look at some of, like you said, the um, the the degradation of of positions out there with regards right. to moon sightings. So, so, so local versus yeah. National. So, so there's okay. So on on yeah within that. So yeah. the methodologies are, are span a big thing. You have really local, and Correct. then you've got global. I see. The Hanafi Madhab his dominant opinion is global sighting. That's right. But at the time when Imam Abu Hanifa had made that opinion or in, in the Madhab, it, the, the globe was from, you know, Khurasan to Andalus. That's right. That's the span of the United States of America. Yeah. Right. That. Yeah. So global. Yeah. Great. I mean, we're global. If we, if we take that opinion with that, with that span, yeah, we're global. But when you're around the entire planet, you know, Saudi Arabia, they're almost 14 hours ahead of us, Mm -hmm. right? And so what happens if they don't see it, for example, and they wait for us to see it? If it's Ramadan, they have to be fasting already. Mm -hmm. And if they can't, because we haven't given them a a sighting yet, Mm -hmm. then global sighting is going to be a really, it's an untenable Untenable. methodology to to use. Even, so the the bigger a net you, 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 you know, you cast out, on the one hand, it might sound like, yeah, that's going to get you more sightings. The problem is, is that You cast out a bigger net, you're just casting out more uncertainty. Hmm. Because then you're going to start finding sightings from places where you think, wait a minute, how could they have seen it there? And then you start tracking people down. And you got to run around for, you know, three or four hours to try to find the person who actually said they saw the moon. And, you know, usually the run around is someone, you know, moon sighted in Texas. So you, you, you find the brother who said it was moon sighted in Texas. And you call the guy and you're like, are you in Texas? No, we're not in Texas. We're in Chicago. Well, how did you find out? My cousin, you know, Abdullah, and, you know, he said, can I have his number? So you call Abdullah and you're like, did you see the moon? He goes, no, I didn't see the moon. And I'm like, well, where are you? He goes, I'm in Kansas. And you're like, okay, well, who saw the moon? He goes, oh, it was Mustafa. So you get Mustafa's number and you call Mustafa. Are you in Texas? Yeah. Did you see the moon? No, I didn't see the moon. Like, who saw the moon? I don't know. Someone in Texas saw the moon. You don't know who it was. I'm like, no. So how did you become the guy who suddenly became world famous that, that you saw them? Like, I have no idea. <laughs> I, I got to say, this sounds like a great like children's book. <laughs> no, like, yeah. You know, like, <laughs> calling Texas. Call, right. you know. <laughs> did you see the moon? Yeah. You? I, you know, when, that, when, when we were going through this, you know, maybe a decade ago, and that was, I put together an outline for a book called, Did You See the Moon? Look at that. Yeah, that's wow. exactly what I wanted to title wow. it because that was the question that I always got. Yeah. Everyone would call me. Did you see the moon? Did you see the moon? I'm like, no, I didn't see the moon. Like, but someone said they saw the moon. I'm like, well, I didn't see the moon. Hmm. I'm like, what are you going to do? I'm like, I didn't see the moon. <laughs> do I need to answer any more? You know, I didn't see the moon. Right. And so, you know, so what, what, at, at Crescent Watch, what we want, yeah, we want it to be as local as we can make it okay. and still serve the Muslim community that we identify with hmm. and that's the north american muslim community okay so what we consider local is north america not so even south america or central america we, we tried south you... america for about almost 10 years i see and it was one we had a language barrier that we had to get over two south america on the west coast which is primarily where we were getting reports from mm-hmm. is further east than new york if you look at the globe oh. and you actually look at the longitudes, it's actually further east than New York. Oh, wow. So, you know, you're getting about almost yeah. almost four hours ahead of us. Right. And because we're in different hemispheres, we have different times. The you know, weather is different. So if we're summertime, mm-hmm. they're wintertime. Mm-hmm. So even if the moon is tracking in the south, if it's in the winter, they're going to have to deal with weather the way we deal with weather when it's our winter and it's their summer. Mm-hmm. And it just it just happens that when it's wintertime for us— the moon is tracking in the north and they have trouble seeing it in their summertime. So they have to rely on the north. And when we have, you know, the inability of seeing it easily, they can because the moon's tracking in the south. That happens in their wintertime. Okay. So we're both at, you know, different times of the year and we're both finding difficulties. So it didn't, it didn't play out as, you know, as easy as we thought it would. So we've been, we've been slowly pulling back from that and trying to just focus on North America. North America. Um, and then, um, uh, my understanding is so, so where is astronomical data used? Okay. <clears throat> so today the astronomical models that we have yeah. for the moon, the sun, the stars are so accurate. We know down to the split second, exactly where it is in the sky. And we know exactly when it, when, so conjunction takes place when the moon and the sun line up. There's an earth, there's an earth sun line that connects the earth and the sun. Mm-hmm. 
When the moon crosses or lines up on that line, that's known as conjunction. Okay. And that's the birth of the new moon astronomically. And we can calculate that to the split second. We know exactly when that happens. There's, there's got to be a certain amount of time for the moon to move away because when that's lined up, you're looking at the, the shadowed side of the moon. You cannot see it. That's right. It's with the sun. So it takes several hours for the moon to move away from that line where light reflecting off of the moon can actually make it to the earth. Mm. And so you need, again, there's, a, there's like five different parameters that you look at for determining when the moon can be seen. One of them happens to be the age of the moon. And record world record moon is something in an area of around 12 hours after conjunction. Got it. As far as I can remember, it was, it was, in, it was in Iran, naked eye sighting, 12 hours. Like record, that's record. So to easily see it, you need about anywhere from like, you know, 15 to 18 hours. 15 is hard, very hard. But 18 hours and on, it becomes really easy to see. Now, those who, those who go with the calculation opinion, are, are they looking at the moment of, conjun- of, of conjunction? No, because okay. you still can't see it. So what they're trying to do with the calculations is come up with a criteria that would mimic seeing the moon. Ah. So, for example, oh, the moon so has to be... with the birth. No. So what they're doing is they're saying, okay, the moon has to set, for example, after the sun on a night after conjunction. So let's say, let's say conjunction took place, let's say 14 hours ago. Okay. And, you know, so you're 14 hours earlier in the, on the, on the planet, you right. know, so 14 hours ago. So when it reaches here, as the sun sets, the moon is 14 hours now moved past the sun, you know, away from the sun. They would say that's a new moon because it's past conjunction and it sets after the sun. And there's, you know, possibly enough of light that you could probably see it. Hmm. given the proper equipment, for example, right? So that's basically the calculation side. They're looking for times when the moon has passed conjunction and the sun sets before it. Okay. So you know that the moon is actually new. It's it's in the the sky. Where there's probability, there's that window of possibility that the moon could be sighted. Yeah, so back back in like the late 80s. Yeah. Well, you see, the thing is, is that we have a huge hit amazing rich history on moon sighting and predicting when the moon will be seen and where. And it, it goes back, I mean, even before Muslim times, it goes back to the Indian astronomy, yeah. it goes back to Greek astronomy. Correct. So there's a huge, you know, corpus of work that's out there. And there's models. Back in the late 80s, uh, an astronomer at the Royal, Royal um, Observatory in England came up with a, a methodology of predicting the visibility, the probability of seeing the moon Mm -hmm. anywhere in the earth. And what he did was he took moon sighting records from the Ottoman Empire. Roughly it had about, I guess, around 250, 270 sighting reports Mm -hmm. with latitude and longitude, you know, as best as they had at the time and whether or not the moon was seen and not seen. Right. And he compiles this data and he looks at it in certain ways, comes up with a formulation and he finds that the data itself matches a regression analysis of a per, of a parabolic shape on the surface of the sphere. And so it's all statistical. And so what he what he came up with <clears throat> was this criteria. It's known as the Yallop criteria. And what it does is it gives you this single parameter that varies. And depending on the strength of this parameter, he breaks it up into like five different zones, easily visible with the naked eye, mm-hmm. visible with perfect conditions in the sky, visible with optical aids, visible only with optical aids, and then the fifth zone was like not visible at all, right? And so this paper goes out and, you know, it it seemed to work, but it's a regression analysis. And so it really depends on the data. The more data you have, the better the model becomes. So one guy over on the East Coast starts this uh, website called moonsighting.com. Yeah, moonsighting.com. Shalka. Uh, Khaled yeah, Khaled and um, so he puts together, he's using the Yallop criteria, but right. he's building his database and he's literally taking, oh, this is the second time I did that. I'm so sorry. <laughs> he he sets up a, a worldwide network and he gets reports from all over the world. And so he just starts building his database and his database is huge now. He's been doing this for decades. And so he's got his model and he's building it. Another um, astronomer in Jordan, um, Hamid Oda, he starts another one, uh, the Islamic Crescent Pro, uh, observation project, ICOP, he's also got a model. And so they each have, you know, tweaked their models over the years 
to, I, I don't, you know, they're just, they're, they tweak them to their liking. Got it. So they have different bands. And at Crescent Watch, we've adopted the Yallop criteria and we've been using it ever since. And we find that it works, it works great. Right. And this, again, it's a probabilistic model. Right. Because it depends on past data to predict given current conditions with the with the astronomical positions of the moon. Oh, okay. So it's okay. it's based on where the moon is in the sky, its age how far away from the sun it is, how much illumination is going to come off of it. So these are all things that we can calculate astronomically for at any instant of the day. And then based on your location on the earth and this model, we come up with a probability of how easy it will be to see the moon in the sky at your location. That's right. The problem is, is that there's no way of actually nailing it down because we can't predict what the sky will be doing. Right. Weather patterns. Weather patterns are completely unpredictable. That's right. Completely unpredictable. Um, even the United States Naval Observatory mm-hmm. has a section on Islamic crescent moons. They have a section on their website, and oh. they talk about mm-hmm. the probabilities, and they say there's no way to accurately predict where the moon will be seen because of sky conditions. We still can't nail that down. Mm. You know, they've got supercomputers that predict weather, and they're only good for, like, at best, three days. You know, three days out, and sometimes they're even wrong. I mean, when was it? How many years ago when we had the drought? Was it five years ago or something? We had Jeez. that. We were in the, yeah. we were in the midst of it, about, and we had the Istisqa prayer over in Pleasanton. You yep. remember that? Yeah, I remember. Hamza did it. I was Shea there. Hamza. We yeah. were there, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. What happened the there. next day? Yeah, it rained. It rained. It, the, the meteorologists were blown away. That wasn't anywhere in their models. And suddenly, it just rained. And it's like you just, there's this there's this level of unpredictability that yeah. you just can't you can't deal with. So nailing down calculation calculation wise where you're going to see the moon. Right can't be done. Right. So it you still have to have someone to see it. Got it. And I mean in 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 the, the dominant opinion in 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 all the that have is that you have to have ru'yat al-hilal. You have to see it with your own eye. Correct. You know, where the Muslim astronomers in the past they had their models and they could predict or as best as they could where they were going to see the moon and yet they never used that. For the for, purposes for of, the purposes of yeah. starting the month, exactly. <clears throat> exactly. it wasn't it wasn't something that was used. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. if someone made a claim to seeing the moon, and the astronomers said that can't happen, that would be taken. That's right. So, so we can we can use negate. we can use the signs to negate a, a sighting if yeah. it, if so it's not false possible. positive. As it yeah, were. exactly. Right. But you can't use it to affirm. Affirm. Yeah. Because you still have to have someone to see the moon. The, the, you know, the beautiful thing about moon sighting, and I was I just wrote this the other day when I was, uh, because we, we just saw the moon. It was just on. Right. So we're, we're, we're recording what, the third? No, the, the second of the hitch. We're on the second of the hitch. Yeah, yeah, yeah so just right. two nights ago, we saw the moon. That's right. And I remember, you know, writing to the. We were instructed we're, to go out on Thursday night. Thursday to night. To go see it. Mm-hmm. And so I was, you know, communicating with Zechariah Twist back and forth. And I, and I, and I remember I, I wrote to him, I said, you know, the blessing of seeing the moon is seeing the moon. That's hmm. the blessing in seeing the moon is you actually see it because it just, it, it's like you're seeing Allah. Yeah. You're seeing his creative power right, right there right. because a moment ago that wasn't in the sky and then right. suddenly it appears out of nowhere and you think, subhanAllah, look at, there it is, Allahu Akbar. Yeah. And it just, yeah, it, we, we um, I mean, just, just from like an, from an out of, of like sort of a biographical, um, you know, anecdotal sort of, uh, perspective. Uh, I never used to actually go out and, and, and try to see the moon, you know, and just kind of rely on reports and rely on basically, you know, Crescent Watch or, you know, the Chicago Hillel Committee or right. what have you. Um, but when I moved out to California about 10 years ago, we started doing so as a family. Yeah. Um, and not every month, but, you know, certainly in the, 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 uh, the, the, the months where there's an obligatory uh, ritual that's directly associated with lunar months. So, um, but that that the, the exercise alone, the, the like the baraka and the blessing of just the exercise of actually going out and doing and, and attempting to sight the moon is is is, is a blessing in and of itself. Yeah, no, it's so rewarding. Yeah, I mean, right. I I it it just it it expands my heart. And like you said, we live time. in the Bay Area where we have the opportunity with regards to vistas. And, oh yeah, you know uh, altitudes and things like that yeah. where we can 
you know, the, the, the probability of being able right. to see it are, is higher than right. in a place where you're going to have obstructed views. Exactly. And, you know, the other, the other thing that it's either a curse or a blessing for the Bay Area itself, <laughs> but we literally are the last word in the world. Ah, that's there's, true. there's no one further west of us. I mean, if you, we, yeah. there are some Muslims on Hawaii, right. but the problem is, is that they're already like three hours beyond us. So you, anybody further east of us, they can't wait for a report to come from Hawaii. I mean, we have that's problems with people in New York that's true. calling us, you know, especially on the critical months, they're calling us, like you know. 10, 11 o'clock at night, night their time. Yeah, and midnight he, at their time. Right. And we're still trying to hammer it out over and here. And they're like, what's the, what's the delay? And we're like, we can't get a positive report anywhere. And they're like, I gotta wake up in the morning. I need to know if I need to pray or eat or not. You That's know, right. or do I fast or what do I do? Lord, it's right, critical. Right. And you know, so literally the West Coast here, we're literally yeah, the last so word. That's so true. Or people are sitting in a mosque waiting for total wave to begin, right? right? Because they think it might be the first tomorrow. Right. Yeah. right. And oh, so hold on. Yeah. yeah. So we're you know, we're it's it's either like I said, either a curse or a blessing for us because, you know, especially if those of us who actually go out. Right. That's a it's a big responsibility for the Omaha mm, to go yeah. out and do that. And I never, like I said earlier, I didn't realize what I had really step, stepped into <laughs> until one year I had, I had, I was literally the only person that had seen the moon mm-hmm. on the planet that made it, you know, that made an announcement that they saw the moon and the, um, the Dio Bundy community that's here in California, they heard that I'd seen the moon. They said, we need, we need a Shahada. And I said, what do you mean? They're like, we need a Shahada. And I said, okay, I'll tell you on the phone. They said, no, no, we got to be right there. You got to be, I said, well, where, where do you want me to go? And I said, no, no, we'll come to you. I said, where are you coming? One, one chef came from Richmond. I was living down in yeah, the yeah, South Bay. Marina, they drove Richmond. all the way down. They came in. I said, come, Bismillah, sit down. Let me make some tea. They said, no, 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 just we'll give us a Shahada. I, you know, they took five minutes. We talked now, yeah. you know, just to introduce each other. Okay. I gave him the shahada. You know, I, they wanted me to say the shahadu, the shahadu, you know, that I yeah, saw That's right. Word. Like witness testimony. Uh, witness testimony. And that was the first time in my life that I actually felt the weight of what was just about to happen. Yeah. And I'm just like, wow, I'm, I'm, this is serious. It was, I think yeah. it could have been a Rajabur Shaban. It was an important month. And it was like. Those Deobendis take that seriously. They take too. it very seriously. <laughs> seriously. Yeah, no, they really do. Yeah. And that was the first time that I really realized that this is an obligation. Mm. You know, it's a fard, it's a fard to be able to keep track of the months. It's fard kifaya for the majority of the year. But Ramadan, and then at the end for Eid al-Fitr and for the Hijjah, it, it, especially if someone's going on Hajj, these are fard ayin. That's right. Every, it's, just, it's just like you need to know when your prayer time comes in. It's a fard ayin for a person to know when the prayer comes in because that's an individual obligation that only you can do. Right. Hmm. The same thing with fasting. When fasting starts, you need to know when the month starts. And it's a it's a individual obligation for you to know when the month starts. And you can you can you can establish that certainty many ways, uh-huh. but it's your responsibility to make sure you've got certainty that Ramadan has started or ended before you act on it. And so, then the endeavor of actually going out and sighting the moon, I mean, that's like a communal obligation. That's a communal like obligation. Like as long as someone from the community exactly. is fulfilling if it. If no one fills that, the entire community in gets sin. in sin. That's yeah. Right. That's right. So someone has to be doing And I wasn't the first. Alhamdulillah, when I came on the scene, um, Abdul Sattar Raydan, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. He, was, he was kind of the guy in the Bay Area really? that, yeah. That SBIA. Was SBIA. The, the Marhum, late. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. And so, uh, yeah, a lot of hamu. But yeah, 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 he was the guy who was here. And so, you know, I was just on his, on his, you know, as a legacy for mm. what he continued. Mm. I remember when Ir- Ir- Irfan is listening Irfan, to the show. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Shout out to Irfan. Yeah. Um, my last two years on campus, I was the president of the Islamic group there on campus, and that those two years we got together with all the. Well, I think we had at the, at, by the second year we had fifteen masajid here on uh, in the Bay Area that we had a the Bay Area Moon Sighting Committee. And all 15 massages that we had were committed to moon sighting. And then the year I finished and I graduated, the, the committee broke up. I don't know what happened. It, mm-hmm. just, it just kind of dissolved and everything went, you know, really crazy after yeah. that. In 97, 90, things went really nuts. But, you know, we've been slowly bringing that back. And we're getting Good. more and more people here in the Bay Area. We get, we, I mean, we've got, we've got, just two days ago, I mean, we had like four or five different teams here in the Bay Area alone that were out there. You know, we had people in, we had people in San Diego. We had people in Los Angeles. We had people, you know, we've got, a, we've got a network now that's building. Oh. We've got people in Florida. We've got people in Texas. We've got people in Pennsylvania and New York, nice. Chicago. We've got, it's right. a growing network mm-hmm. and that's what we need. And, you know, several years ago, I thought what we need to do is like create some kind of, you know, social media movement where we can get, because I heard this story in South Africa years ago, maybe a decade or 15 years ago, two guys on the East 
part of South uh, South uh, Africa had made a claim that they saw the moon. Okay. And Johannesburg is on the west side. And so the entire Muslim community in Johannesburg, 50,000 strong, went out. No one saw the moon. So how did they see it in the east and we couldn't see it in the west? Mm -hmm. So they negated that sighting entirely. I said, see, that's what we need. Mm -hmm. You need 50,000 people to just go out and look for the moon. If everyone says they either saw it or didn't saw it, how's anyone going to, you know, argue with that? That's right. And I don't know. I'm not a social media guy. I can't figure out how the system works. And so I don't deal with it. But we're slowly building so for play, do you know of places like in in, the, in some of the major cities that you mentioned, like San Diego, Chicago, Houston, uh, if we have listeners who are from those cities where they can go and tap into these networks where people go out and try to do naked night moon sighting? I don't I don't have that information for those local local okay. local things, but you know, we've got a, a hub which is Crescent Watch where okay. people can just come. They can it's an individual thing. Go out. You know, don't rely on anyone, just go out. It doesn't require any astronomical knowledge. You just go out. Sunsets in the west on the night when the moon will be seen, it'll be setting right behind the sun, and it's going to be in the western sky. You just need to look in the west. You don't have to. Don't have gonna, to. I was going to have you yeah. like do that before we left, which yeah. is kind of you know give us a a little uh, you know one on one in sure. terms of where. Yeah, yeah. It's just it's just in the western sky. Wherever the sun sets, the moon is going to be to the left of it. To the left. Always. There are rare occasions where the moon will be directly above, usually in spring. Um, but for the most of the time of the year, it's going to be to the west, to the left of the sun. And probably best seen, what, a good maybe 10, 15 minutes after sunset? It, it, it depends. Like Maghrib comes it, in. It depends. Yeah. But usually usually you have time to pray Maghrib yeah. before you can see the moon. That's right. Yeah, because the sky has to darken Beautiful. to build enough contrast because the light that's reflecting off the moon is very faint. That's right. So the, the brightness of the sky has to dim enough that the moonlight can actually penetrate through it. Mm. So it takes time. So you definitely have time to pray Maghrib and then afterwards spend the time and look. Um, you know, there's a myriad of astronomical applications out there. You can just pick one That's right. and just find out when moon set is. Right I mean, on your phone. Else. When you yeah. say applications. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On the phone, phone today, it's just crazy now. But <laughs> yeah. just all you really need to know is moon set. And if you're looking before moon set, you have the possibility of seeing it in the sky if the sky is clear. And if not, if it's past moonset, go home. You didn't see it. <laughs> then ask around, see if anyone else saw it. Because mm. it's going to depend on where you are. You know? So, so the, the the website again is crescentwatch.com. Dot com. Okay. Oh, and you get a website. Or is it dot org? I don't remember. No, it, it, it's crescentwatch.org. Yeah, dot org. Dot org. Yeah, I right. always get confused with that. And, and yeah, b- before we let you go, uh, I did want to give you a chance to talk about organic so, light Organic photography. light. Yeah. So... And we usually have our guests tell us where people can yeah. be in touch so with them. The photography so, yeah. started because of the moon. Right. Right. And yeah. when I would go out waiting for the moon, I started mm-hmm. photographing other things because it just looks so beautiful in the setting sun. So that started building. And then I decided, let's see if I can make this into, you know, a business. So my wife's best friend's getting married. Right. So she, it, she demands that I photograph her wedding. And I'm like, okay, I'll do what I can. <laughs> right. <laughs> we go there. During the uh, the Ketbul Kitab, and we're sitting there, and so the groom's family, right, sitting with me, and they see my camera, and so the groom's brother looks at me and he goes, "So you're you're into photography?" And I'm like, "Yeah, you know, I kind of do it as a hobby, but you know, I'm helping out here because you know my wife's best friend." I don't know. And yeah. He goes, and then he says, um, "He goes, so what do you do? You use all kind of filters and all kind of all that stuff?" And I'm like, "No, I just pretty much use straight photography." He goes, "Oh, kind of organic, huh?" <laughs> and I'm like, "Can I use that?" And he goes, what? Because I had been looking for a name for the business because I wanted to, you know, make it, you know, official. And one of the biggest photographers in nature was uh, Galen Rowell. And he had his uh, his studio over here in Emeryville it was called Mountain Light Photography because he was a mountain climber. And he was one of the first guys to carry a 35 millimeter camera on rock climbs wow. and take pictures from vantage points that no one could yeah. have ever have taken. So he, he became famous through that work. And 35 millimeter. Yeah, 35 millimeter. So... Mountain light photography. I'm like, it's awesome. I, I want something blah, 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 light photography, right? Because to me, just saying use of Ismail photography just yeah, felt yeah. pretentious to me. You know, right. I'm like, I'm not, I didn't make the creation, right? I'm just photographing it. Right. It's not like it's mine. That's right. So and I wanted to find something. And, and light is so integral. I mean, light is integral. Light, oh, no, totally. Yeah, 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 yeah. So when he said kind of organic, huh? And I said, <laughs> can I use that? And so at first I'm like, organic light photography, it sounds kind of hokey. But I went ahead and I used it anyway. 
took me about a year to actually formulate like what that meant. And eventually I came up with, you know, and that you can read that on the website under the about section about why I call it organic light. And, but that's where the origin of the name came from. Nothing very fancy, but. Well, you was teased the, well, well, you told us the origin story, but, yeah. t- but, but tell us a little bit more. So, about okay. Where, so, yeah. so, you know, light is this amazing. Yeah. It, it's amazing. I mean, I, it, it, it's a, it's an, it's an entity in our, in, our, in the creation that has so many different facets to it. On the one hand, it's what allows us to see, and yet it's invisible. I mean, there's light moving between us right now. We don't see it. It only becomes visible when it interacts with an object. Mm. And then you see light. So the organic part. Right, the, the organic part. So what happens is photons of light enter into an object and excite the electrons that are built into the atoms of these objects. And these atoms then with their energized electrons, they jump to higher energy levels, but that's not where they want to be. It's unstable. When the electrons drop back down to their normal stable orbits in their atoms, they emit a new photon. And that photon that leaves the atom depends on the atom itself. So every atom emits its own light. Unique. It's unique to that object. Yeah. And it's also going to be unique depending on the light that falls on it and at what time of the day, the angle and everything. And so what we're really seeing is an interaction between pure light and these objects. And so that interaction is constantly changing over time. Right. So things that are continuously changing over time tend to be alive. And so that was the, the idea behind where I'd say, okay, this is an organic interaction that's taking place. Even though it's inorganic matter, I mean, it's photons and atoms, it's still an organic process that's taking place. And that's what we see with our eyes. In the hmm. absence of light, you're blind, right? In complete darkness, you're blind. And in, in, if you were to look into pure light, and you, the closest thing that we have to that would be the sun. The sun if you looked in it, don't, don't do that. You'd be light. blinded by the light. So That's at both true. extremes, you're blinded. But in the middle, where you have light mixing with darkness, you get shade. And so we're literally in the shade. Hmm. It's nice. Yeah, that's what we're that's what we're in. We're in the shade, and that shade is the 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 mercy that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala puts in this world for allow us to be able to, you know, that's right. see things. Because without without that mercy of shade, we wouldn't be able to see. And, and so where is that website and where can people so, find out more about organic light? Organiclightphoto.com. Okay. And uh, I mean, if you, even if you just Googled organic light, unfortunately, I don't know how to deal with this, but someone in Colorado started an organic light photography and now they get all the Google hits Ugh. instead of me. Hmm. Because Ugh. I didn't know, I, you know, like I said, I was new to this whole internet thing. So I just did, at the time, no one liked big URLs. And so I was trying to make it as short yeah, as yeah. possible. So it's organiclightphoto.com. And I figured that should be good enough. I didn't think about, you know, reserving all the other variations of it. So theirs is organiclightphotography.com. Mm. And she's a portrait photographer. But we're in the Bay Area. We're so in the Bay someone's got to so, figure out a yeah, solution. But it's organiclightphoto.com. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And, and there, we there go. you can, yeah, I've got all my, all the work that's up on the, on and that. And people can also purchase. They can purchase prints? from the website. Um, oh. They can. Okay. Place an order. Yeah. I'm, the, the gateway is kind of hokey because of PayPal, but. <laughs> yeah, if you place an order, I'll get in touch with you. We'll work it out somehow, inshallah. Wonderful. Awesome. Well, I hope people will. And uh, I hope people enjoyed this conversation, which thank covered you. a whole range of yeah. very interesting topics. So thank you so much for spending a little over an hour with us. Uh, as we wrap things up, uh, again, those websites are crescentwatch.org and organiclightphoto.com. Uh, as far as us, you can find us online on Facebook, facebook.com slash Diffuse Congruence. You can message us there. You can also email us at diffusecongruence at gmail.com. If you're looking for Pervez, you can find him. I'm on Twitter at uh, Pervez uh, F. Ahmed. And I am at Zeki's Corner, Z-A-K-I-S Corner. That's also my uh, website, just at com. And again, I want to thank our guest, Dr. Yusuf Ismail, for joining us. And thank you, everybody, for listening. And by the time you are hearing this, uh, I guess we can say Eid Mubarak. That's right, Eid Mubarak. Uh, yeah, and uh, also I think I don't, I don't think we've actually, um, you know, called attention to it or, or 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 actually specifically referenced it. But you recently got uh, picked up by the San. You know, you have you have a new gig. Why don't you you know talk it up a little bit? Uh, I I am <laughs> doing film reviews for the San Francisco Chronicle, and so that is uh, awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, and so that's been uh, a lot of fun. I I mean I. I do that anyway, so I know, right. it's uh, kind of crazy. Now you get paid for it. 
Uh, well, I've been getting paid for it for a little while, but yeah. uh, there there is a level of prestige which That's obviously comes with the title. But you know, obviously, uh, awesome. you, you try not to let that go to your head. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, that is awesome. It, yeah. I, I think I mentioned on my other show that I was uh, feeling a massive amount of imposter syndrome when I first saw my name in the Chronicle, and then somebody else pointed out to me. They're like, "Well, how long have you been writing reviews?" And I was like, "Well, twenty three years now and they're like okay so i don't think you get to have imposter syndrome yeah, like you've, you've 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 earned your way in and you know it's it's it is nice so if you go to the uh sf chronicle website and also you know it i've seen my stuff show up in like the houston chronicle and various other uh by via it's like hearst yeah it's yeah, syndicated by hearst mm-hmm. so um uh i've seen some cool stuff you know oh, congratulations uh, thank you thank, yeah, thank you for bringing that And uh, yeah, that's a good place to wrap up this discussion. We hope you'll join us next time. And thank you, everybody, for listening.